Hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest Arboricultural Association Wednesday webinar, sponsored by Steel. I'm John Parker, Chief Executive Officer at the Association here in Stonehouse, but not in the office, in my house. Welcome to my house. But please don't just show up unannounced. I wouldn't like that at all. Please say hello in the chat, selecting everyone as you do so. Let us know where you're watching from. Submit any questions you've got using the Q&A button. We'll work through as many as we can at the end. Please also remember that there is a closed captioning facility should you require it. Tonight is all about roots. And I'm blurring my background, so I have to do this. I'm wearing a Roots t-shirt. Can you see it? And uh, I've got a Roots book. Uh, and uh, we've got the authors of the Roots book. And it's very exciting. Kristen and Oliver. And uh, they're live from Norway. Imagine that. All the way from Norway. Uh, we've still got a few more webinars this series after this one. On February the 7th, Russell Miller and James Chambers will be asking, why do we lose so many trees? And they'll be focusing on decay detection techniques. And a week later... On February the 14th, show your Valentine you love them by tuning in to our webinar. <laughs> Carrie Brady and Helen Carl will be talking about the bacterial microbiome of diseased lime trees. And Asha Peterson will be presenting the Wild Streets Project. Nothing says Happy Valentine's Day like bacterial microbiomes. So uh, show someone you care. And you can register for those two webinars absolutely free right now with the links that will appear in the uh, chat. As ever, if you've got any thoughts or comments or ideas or anything about the Wednesday webinars, please do get in touch. You can email me directly, john at trees.org.uk. And it's always good to hear what you all think about everything. To business. It is my great pleasure to welcome our speakers to the virtual stage Kristen and Alvin, over to you. Oh, thank you very much, thank John. You. Thank you. We're very pleasant to be here. And it's a very great webinar series you have. I'm really amazed at what you have uh, done. It's good. It's good. And I really like your tea skirt. It's lovely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, welcome to this uh, presentation about roots and how... And this project about a field guide for identification of tree roots. In this uh, picture you see here, you see 12 uh, pictures of different tree species. And as you can see in this picture, they are very, very different. And this is actually something we just find found out when we are doing this project. So we will tell you a bit about the project the reason for it and the beginning for why we did it and the aim, what the purpose is and the results and the end so far. And we are two persons here today, so I can first introduce myself. My name is Kristin Moldesta. I'm a um, horticulturist educated by the University and Agriculture University in Norway. And I'm also a certified arborist. I work as a consulting at the a consulting arborist at the Trek on Tour, and I'm also a teacher at a school in Norway. So, Olve. Yeah, my name is Olve Lundetre. I'm a landscape gardener and a certified arborist. I'm a practicing arborist, so I climb trees, uh, and I also do consulting. Uh, I work in a company which I co-own with two other people, just a small arborist company in Norway. Uh, where we do most tree work. Yeah. Climbing and stuff. Climbing and stuff. And you have actually been the championship, tree yeah. climbing champion. Yeah, no I'm way. Norwegian tree climbing champion <laughs> a couple of times. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. Shall we start? Some of you may have heard this story before, but the whole project started with this oak tree. As you can see, this oak tree is in a kindergarten. If you see very closely, you see some um, some kinders, not kinder, but some playground around it. And there are lots of different trees. Um, the only thing is that they are going to fell all this tree and build buildings around it. And that's because this tree, this particular oak tree is 200 centimeter in circumference. And then it's protected by Norwegian law. You don't, you're not allowed to fell it, or if you're going to fell it, you have to apply 
to fell it and you will probably get a no anyway, especially if it's a nice tree and it's a healthy tree like this. So luckily the architects think that this is a very, very nice tree as well. And it's possible to save it in the, in the uh, building. And this is some early drawings where we see where they're going to build the house quite close to the tree and they have um, um, draw the root zone fairly something. And we were asked to um, make this tree live through all the planning and the building. The house are not built yet, so they haven't come so far. But uh, we wanted to, we we were going to be in charge of the tree and make sure that that will be okay. So we started to try to find the roots and we used a tomograph. I'm not quite sure if all of you know what that is, but that you can lock up. Uh, and we get some quite strange results. So we had to use an excavation tool to do some digging and to see if we could find the roots. For of course, the tree had roots, and we did find. A lot of roots. This is a photo by Roger Eklund. And he we discover a mangle of roots. And we could see that the roots were from different, they would look different, but we could not at that point tell which root come from which tree. So we start looking in the internet and um, in books, and we did not find any book that could tell us what we actually saw. There are very, very many good books about tree roots. I will just say that for sure. But none, the, there were no books that you could actually take with out in the field and, um, and um, use, like, um, like you use for flowers. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we began our project of find out more about roots. Uh, we wanted to find out what roots with secondary thickening looked like um, and if it was possible to tell what species the roots originated from. Um, luckily, we had access to roots from uh, various digging projects in Oslo. There was a huge digging project at the Royal Gardens in Oslo and also other parks. We also had access to an abandoned nursery in the west of Norway. And also we were granted access to the tree collection in the landscape laboratory at the Norwegian University of Life Science. Um, so, so far we have identified nearly 50 different tree species. Uh, in the book, the roots are described in words and with pictures, uh, the findings have formed the basis of for an on-site method for identifying tree roots. Um, the project may not give answers to all the questions about roots, and it's not meant to be either, but we hope it can help other arborists and maybe give them the confidence to speak out for a tree that is needed to be preserved. Maybe be able to change the direction of a ditch when we were building some meters, maybe. Um, so we set ourselves the goal to create a field guide for identifying tree roots. So in the process of identifying tree roots, we use simple tools uh, like a pruning shear, a camera, water, bucket, spade, measuring tape, and a magnifying glass. Uh, with a digital camera and a macro lens, uh, good lighting and this white photo tent, we could take quality photos, which we could use in our book. Okay. Yeah. Um, as you can see here, magnifying is important in recognizing roots. Uh, this is an ash tree and it's ring porous, uh, but the vis uh, vessels are barely visible. You can't see them at all, almost. And you can't see any rays at all. 
in the root. With a proper lens on a camera or a magnifying glass, it all becomes much clearer. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So in this project, we decided that we would um, use roots that are uh, half a centimeter to one and a half centimeter uh, thick. This is because those roots can be cut off without doing permanent damage. Uh, and they are often visible in trenches. The roots are also have secondary growth, and some even have um, year rings, uh, annual rings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, today. Yeah, and what do we actually see? We have to have, we have to know what to look for. And as you can see in this picture. They, these two roots look very, very different. You have the aceplatanoides on, um, I'm not quite sure what's left and wrong, left and right. Is that left? That's left. Yeah. That's left, on the left side. And then you have the populus alba on the right side. And to be able to tell the difference between these two roots and other roots, you need to know what you are looking at. So if you see the, the error, uh, the marking, it's marked on a bark pore or what you can call a lenty cells. And they grow in different ways. On the populus, they grow on, um, uh, they run either along the, the growth, the growth or opposite the growth. So you see there is a difference. And that's a very good sign to recognize the roots. And when you have a cross section, because often you have to take a cross section as well, this is what you see, and you have to be able to ex explain what you see. So we have put up some mark here. It's the outer bark, or actually, roots doesn't have bark; they have periderm, but we call it bark because that's easier and that's more common to use. So we have in this project divided the bark into outer bark and inner bark. And in the middle, you have the xylem. And here you can see the medullary rays that goes from the center of the root. You see the white uh, stars or the white lines that go from the center and out. And you see this circle, the, the white circle is the vascular cambium. And if I go just back, you, you can actually not see the vascular cambium, but you can see there is a difference between the bark and the xylem. And that's where the vascular cambium are. So here you see two different roots. It's a sycamore or a pseudoplatanus and a red oak. And you see very clear difference between the xylem vessels, who are quite big in the quercus and small in the asa. And of course, you see the rays, very bright, clear in the quercus. It's quite nice, I think, that one. And also the sycamore is very nice, very, very soft to look at. So we will tell you a bit more about the, the oaks because in Norway, the oaks have a special protection. So they're very important for us to know oak roots because that's the most protected tree we have. So here you see uh, English oak, Quercus ruber. You see very, very clearly the nice rays. They're quite thick and goes out from the middle of the root. And in between, you see the xylem vessels. And these are actually so big that it's possible to see them without magnifying glasses. And if you happen to have a bit of a root from an, an oak tree, I will recommend you to go home, wash it, and try to use it as a straw because you can actually suck water through it. And then you have the feeling of what power is inside the tree. It's very funny. Uh, if you see, you can also see the difference between the, um, uh, the smaller and the finer roots. If you see on the picture down there, you on the other side, you see uh, smaller roots. They're quite fine and thin. But if you have a look at the, the close-up down there, you see also that the finer roots has on oak have a club-shaped end. So there is more to study to see more difference between finer roots. And here you have also a, a Quercus ruber. And this picture just showed you to show that there are some differences also inside one species. And here is actually just one root that is being washed and not washed, and you can still see the rays. 
it's a quite big root. I would not recommend you to cut such a big root that this was going to be cut anyway. Uh, if you now want to look at more different species, different kind of oak trees, you see that they are actually quite different old oak species as well. You see the Quercus lirata and upper left have almost just visible xylems and the next one has almost just rays. So there are quite a big ra a range of, um, of um, identification signs you can see on the, on the different oak roots as well. The next one we will tell you about is the Scotch elm or the Olmus glabra. This tree is sadly probably going to die from and leave the earth <laughs> because of um, this um, Dutch elm disease. But we still have some of it here in Norway and probably in some other country as well. So we want to take care of it. And this is how the roots look like when they are exposed with just an air tool. And but if you have a closer look, you see quite nice the nice texture on them in the roots, and they have like these orange spots, which are the bark pore. And one funny thing about these roots is if you actually if you cut the root, it's bright, bright white, and it turns yellow after a while. It's almost as bright as the flesh of a coconut. So it's quite funny to to cut it. And here we tried to make a picture of a fresh root and a five minutes old root. And the fresh root is, of course, not totally fresh because I had to cut it and then put it up and then take a photo. So it's some seconds um, not fresh, but still, you see the color changing here. But the most funny thing about the elm or the, just the elm's glabra is that it actually gets slimy after a while in air. It has this uh, secrete that comes out of the root. You can see it on the fine roots and the thick roots. And it's uh, actually supposed to be quite healthy to eat if you want to bake a, have, <laughs> have it in your bread or something. They used it in the old days. We go further to the lime. Um, lime are, this is um, a large leaved lime tree. They have actually very flexible roots what we did find um, because mostly the roots are quite flexible when you take it out of the soil anyway but this still this is also flexible after a while in the air and <clears throat> here you see an example of the color changing wet roots are orange and dry roots are more grayish it's uh, i think the wet roots of um, this tree looks like the branches in the spring. So they're quite similar above ground and um, below ground. And here we have uh, a cross section of this root. It has also a bit of color changing, but not as much as, um, not as much as the elm tree, but still. And you see the fine lines with rays and it's quite small xylem vessels. All these are lime trees. And here we have another comparing. We have the um, Acer campestre and then Acer platanoides. They are the same uh, family, but and they look quite the same, but still you can see there is a difference between uh, the bark and the periderm with the lenticels. And you also see the difference in the cross sections. But they still have this orange inner bark and this quite brownish outer bark and light um, color of the xylem. Mm -hmm. And the next picture I will show you is one of the nicest ones. So maybe some of you have seen it before because this is one of my beloved pictures. It's an Aeschylus hippocastanum. Take a breath and look at it. It's really, really nice. Is bright white, and you can see the the annual rings, and you see the dark brownish uh, outer bark. And this root is actually one centimeter in diameter. And if you count all the year rings or the annual rings, or what we should call it, you can you will come to around nine. And we know that. 
earrings underground are not as accurate as above ground, but still it says something about the age of the root. So this one centimeter diameter root may be around nine year old. And if you compare that to a branch that is one centimeter, that's usually just one or maybe two, yeah. So when you cut a root, in this size, you actually take away maybe like nine years of growth, could be. So that's something to think about and maybe study some more because I think this is very important to get to know what actually happens underneath the ground. And the fascinating uh, uh, horse chestnut is still has a very nice um, uh, bark as well. It's camouflage with this brown and brownish blackish camouflage and they have very gnarled growth and there is a huge difference between wet roots and dry roots in color you see the picture at the down there you see the bright bright color on the wet root it's really nice color it's almost the same color as the nuts for this one yes and we have um the conifers they are another kind of three roots they are actually quite similar to each other, more or less than what we have. Oh no, not all of them, of course, not all of them. But the, they we have seen are quite orange and they have uh, racing channels and you can smell them. They have this distinct, nice smell of racin. So if you have, if you can see, you can just sniff them in and then you will, oh, this is root. You can actually, uh, uh, smell this from the, the soil and if you compare two different kind of um, of conifers this is a Scottish pine, Pinus sylvestris and a eastern white pine Pinus trubus and you see they have a different pattern in the racing channels it's quite distinct and in the middle of um, the um, eastern white pine you see four quite clear big um, racing channels it's actually quite challenging to take a picture of these roots because there's so much racing coming out, so you have to be quite quick. Um, and here we have another family, Fabasa, or the pea, pea or bean family. Uh, here you see three different kinds of roots. It's the labonum or the golden chain tree, the black locust in the middle, and the Japanese pagoda tree on the left right right on the right <clears throat> and in the top corner we put just um a skeleton just to remind you that some of the roots actually are poisonous you shouldn't eat them i don't think you go and eat them for lunch very much but still just keep in mind that some of the roots can have poisonous stuff inside them these roots looks quite similar when you see them in cross section they are more or less yellowish in the middle, in the xylem, and then you have this white, quite thick inner bark, and then a thin outer bark. But if you see them, you don't have to cut them to identify these roots. They look like this, non-cutting. The laburnum is more like orange, and it's an orange uh, bark pores, and the black locust has these white lines that goes across the length growth, and the Japanese pagoda tree is totally the totally different um, uh, texture on the bark and much darker and here is also one of my favorite i'm not quite sure if you have this one it's the black elder alnus glutinosa as you can see it turns orange after exposed in the air just as the branches do and uh, it's um but it actually takes quite a time. And if you see on the upper picture here, you see it's not very sharp um, cutting. That's also because the root is a bit soft. So when you touch it, or when you cut it, you feel it's, it's quite easy to cut, but it won't make a very nice uh, cutting. But the most funny thing about this root is this. Isn't that cool, huh? It's actually the nitrogen nitrogen fixing root noodle. Uh, it looks like a tree or, or some grapes or something like that. 
And this is uh, the reason why these trees do not have um, autumn colors, because it produces its own nitrogen. It actually has its own fabric down in the ground. In, in the ground. I think this is very nice, and th they have lots of it. You see it on both pictures here. Um, and next one uh, is very nice. It's uh, oops, not that. It's the maiden hair tree or the ginkgo ginkgo biloba. It's a very strange root. It's soft to touch. It's you can actually squeeze it a bit and look at it. It's pink. It's pink inside. Why is it pink? I don't know, but it's very nice. And you have this beautiful fabric or the bark. It looks like fabric on the outer on on the the yeah, the bark. And if you see on the upper picture, there are quite strange, smaller roots that are very thick and yeah, it looks strange and has very, we, we have seen quite a diff, quite a couple of this uh, tree and they all look the same, very weird. And they have this thick, thick um, uh, pink uh, in the bark, but it's soft and we didn't find so many soft roots, but this is pink. But we also have yellow, yellow roots, like the Juglans nigra. Uh, they have actually this yellow shimmering in the in the trench you see here. This trench was um, dug to have some cabling underneath the, the trees. It's, it's near the botanical garden, so they weren't allowed to cut any roots. So this is good. And after a while in, um, in uh, air, the cross section also turns very, very yellow. This is actually the first picture we ever we took of this route, so I think, yeah, it could be better. <laughs> and here you see the butternut. The butternut has not yellow color outside. If you compare the butternut to the eastern black walnut, or this is yellowish, you can say, and this one are more blackish, and they also turn yellow in the end after a while. Uh, you see the picture with the, the cross section here. It's quite yellowish in the in the in the bark, and and this one I, I I thought it was quite nice to look at this one, so I I saved it in my pocket and I should show it to someone the day after. And then it was turned totally black, so of course it changed color after a while in air, air that one as well. But it was just to cut it once, cut it more, and then it was yellow again. And we have more yellow roots, of course. We have this one, the Morus nigra. T to find this, we had no clue that this tree would have these extraordinary roots. It was more or less to find gold. I thought when digging down there, was whoa, what is this? It's actually bright yellow, and we have a close-up here of it. It's bright yellow, bright orange. And you see there are all uh, purple lines. That's the, um, uh, the bark pore. It's cool, isn't it? And inside it looks like this. Yellow, no, yeah, yellowish. And this one was a bit rotten as well. I've heard that this, this kind of tree often get rotten in the roots, but still it's nice. And you have this quite thick um, whitish in the bark. Uh, yes, Olwe, what do, will you say now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going, this was some of the roots we have found. We have found also more and more in the, the book collection we have, but um, now we will tell you a bit about the method for identification of roots in the field. We did. Um... We had, uh, had a look at a method of identification that we can, can be carried out on site um, without the need of to send roots over after analysis at the laboratory. Uh, the tools we used, as previously mentioned, are pruning shears, a camera, and water. Um, if you look at the pictures, this is not what it normally looks like when we dig up roots. <laughs> it looks more like a picnic in the park. Um, it's always dirty, always muddy, 
loud machines nearby. Um, yeah, so this this does not represent. But um, the process of identifying roots on sites, you first have to dig up the root, of course, and you, you wash it. Uh, and you st study the outer layer of the root. Uh, you cut it with a, a clean, sharp pruning shear or you can use a sharp knife if you have one. And then you can take a picture of it on, with your phone uh, or use a magnifying glass. I find that taking a picture with my phone, I can take a good picture and good focus and enlarge it on my phone so I can study it more closely. find that very helpful. Um, when you study it, you can compare the picture and the route to the pictures and text in the book, or maybe you have a, a gallery of your own on your camera that you can, from previous assignments that you can look at, and you can, by help of what grows around you, you can find out what tree species it is. Um, yeah. Yep. Yes. And by cutting off a piece of root, you have gotten yourself a root sample. So you can use that to identify other roots from the same tree. Um, so with the visual characteristics of the root, you will be able to compare the root to other roots nearby. And as you can see on this slide, there's, yeah, there's a difference between the Acer on the left and the Aeschylus on the right. And that's the whole point of the book, to give you an idea of what to look for. Yeah. Uh, this is quite a common scenario where uh, there's a bus stop and there's going to be an upgrade on a bus stop. You have, you have a bus shelter in there and the bus shelter needs electricity and the electricity needs to be collected from the white box up the road and in the garden on the side there's a hedge and trees on the inside and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. I jump over that one. Okay. Yeah. So even with prior digging for infrastructure, as you can see, there's pipes in the ground, and there's yeah, the roots are still still grows. So you can't even there's when there's been digging done before, you can't assume that you're not going to find roots. There are roots, they can grow quite far in a short period of time under the right conditions. And this, um, this is more like it when what's happening when we are digging up roots. Um, we loosen up the soil with compressed air or some from some air spade or air knife or whatever uh, and we use a big truck like a vacuum and we hoover the soil up so we don't damage the roots while ex excavating so that's that okay yeah yeah so like this this is a place where there is going to be a fence built around the property. And there are big old trees nearby. And in the top left corner there, there's some... They've been try they tried to protect the stem of a tree. And you can see the uh, quite a few roots. And in the, uh, in the bottom of the ditch here, there's a lot of big roots that 
are covered in soil. Uh, so the solution for protecting the roots and protect, protecting the trees was to build small blocks of concrete in a shape that allowed them to be between the roots so we can cover the roots with good soil and can build the fundament for the fence on top of the concrete blocks. So we put some pillars of concrete on top of the blocks and built the mold and pour the concrete in on top of those pillars again and filled underneath the fundament. We just filled it up with soil. So it's quite a good solution, I think, for protecting trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, think. and then we have this uh, example. Here it's an oak tree, and the, um, they were going to build a house or infrastructure where you see the shrubs. And um, the builder said there are probably no oak road, roots underneath the shrub. And yes, there probably are. Uh, no, 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 no way. And then we yeah, actually, okay, we can see, we can have a look because I think there will be oak roads on the shrub as well. And then we use this um, vacuum um, hoover, is it? Uh, to take away the soil. You see here, here you see when you put this machine and you suck up the soil and then you see a lot of different roots. And we find two, two different routes in this situation. And it was quite easy to see, oh, we have actually a shrub and a tree here. And I could actually very clearly say, okay, this is the oak and this is the shrub. So they could not... Oh, yeah, we will see if the tree will survive or the shroom house will be built. That will that's another story. Come back to that later. <laughs> but still it's quite cool to see the difference between the roots and to be able to see I this is actually what you see, and there are roots far away from the stem for the, a big tree, which is not a, actually a big surprise, but it's it's good to have the evidence. But I didn't know. Yes. Okay. All that. Uh, as some practice in arborists, we often come up, uh, find ourselves on building sites where, yeah, you can't really understand what the planners have been thinking because uh, at this site here, uh, there was going to be built a parking garage underneath. Or next to the building on the right, underneath tree root, because the tree is standing exactly on the border between two properties, and but the roots aren't low. So yeah. uh, th this tree was is still a hundred twenty year old maple tree, a sycamore. Um, uh, and we had to expose all the roots, the, all the bigger roots, uh, prune them some and wrap them in burlap, keep them moist and again wrap them in insulation and suspend them in air so they can dig out and you know all the other things they have to do to get rid of all the things underneath um yeah so no? yeah okay so construction work is uh, uh construction work and existing trees are a common and complex combination um, the responsibility to oversee the, the protection of and the well-being of trees often falls on the arborist. Um, the arborist has to be on site 
every time there's work near the roots uh, and check that because people in excavators and all those things they don't actually care so they have to be told to care uh, and the artist has to have the knowledge and you know the uh, is to you know be able to tell people that you have to protect the trees and the roots um regrettably this tree is now dying uh, i think the project was finished about 15 years ago no 10 years ago 11 11 um Trill is still living, but it's still living, but it's slowly dying back. Because uh, after the building was done and it was all covered up, um, it wasn't enough, really. The production. Mm -hmm. This is this is the yeah. This is the final result. It's quite uh, cool to see, or it's, it's not cool. It's um, actually quite sad. But it's uh, it's show what we do to our underground situation. Hmm. Yeah, so the picture on the right there is the finished parking garage, and the swell there you see in the middle of the picture is the same swell you see in the middle of the picture on the left, and the roots are in the box over there. So, not the best conditions for roots, really, but that was the best we could do. So the whole project costed quite a lot, and I think they used three more months to build this garage and try to save the tree. And the tree still lives, but it could have been probably much more healthier if this haven't, hadn't happened. So that's the story. We'll see how many years it goes before it's totally are dead. But all this knowledge we have here, we have them compacted into a little this little field guide. And I have held several um presentations around in the world. And it's it's quite fascinating to have this um to have this presentation because there are so many people coming. And the thing I think is the best thing with this is that people come up and say, but this is actually what we see. This is this is real. This is uh, something we we need. We need more more um, knowledge about what root looks like, and we need to have it quite easy. Uh, and it's fascinating to see all those people coming in and just like sharing the the enthusiasm for roots it's good and i think this is a, this, this is good for for maybe the trees can live longer because not all the roots shows show their roots like this um, beech tree on the west coast of norway it's on the river bank and you see part of the roots here but mostly this is what we always see we see the tree the stem and mm, nothing because it's underground of course the roots grow on the ground and we, when we work with trees, we we know that trees have roots, but not everybody knows that trees have roots. Or, of course, they know it when they think about it. But if you're going to dig here and you don't see what you are destroying, it's easy to destroy. So that's, I think, it's one of our main goals with this project to to make people aware of the roots more clearly. So we will have to thank the Nordic Fund for Urban Trees, or in Norwegian, Nordisk Fond for Bytrer, for supporting the publication of the, the first edition of the book in Norwegian. This is actually the first book, the ever, ever first book, just got from the storage. Very happy there. <clears throat> and we also, of course, have to thank you very much for um, the Arboriculture Association for translating and proofreading and do all the things with the book and publish the book in English. So very thank you very much to Sarah for your bright eye. It's 
yeah, you're very good in proofreading and Georgina and John and the fabulous team at Arbor Culture Association. We really are very happy. And yeah, it was very, very fun to be at your conference there and see all the tea skirt you had, uh, you had to print it out. Very nice. So the book uh, is now available in UK and Europe through the Arboriculture Association bookstore. And it's also possible to buy it from the ISA, uh, International Society of Arboriculture bookstore in the U US and America. And of course, in Norway, in Norwegian. And uh, it's going to be translated to German in um, in April. They're working on it, on it now. So it will be... Uh, uh, it will be released at um, in Augsburg at the conference there. If you want to read more about the project, there are um, some articles that have been written, one in English in the ISA Arboros News, one in Spanish. So thank you, Pepe. I'm not quite sure if you are here, but so thank you for translating it to um, Spanish. And of course, in Norwegian, for all of you that I know love Norwegian. But... We have found out that there are more to find out, and there are more tree roots to describe. There are lots of more tree roots to describe. We have just seen the top of it, and I think we need more information about this. So I'm sure you're eager to look at the next picture here, because we were very, uh, when I was in New Jersey, we were able to go to the Middle Lake. Arboretum, thank you to Joe Grape and his crew to dig up some roots. And so here is just a little taste. Have you seen the roots of Metasequoia glutostroboides or Dawn Redwood, as it probably made easier to see? It's actually bright pink or purple. It looks like art. I think it's a, the natural kind of art. If you see the cross section here, you see the fine, fine rays and the also pink in the bark. And this tree actually have a pit. And we have actually also studied some magnolia and some of the older trees, like the, the trees from the dinosaur time. Some of them have a pit and modern trees do not have a pit. So that's also quite interesting. I don't know why, but it's interesting. And we also have, um, I'll show you one more American tree. I know this is this tree is hated and beloved. It's the America sweet gum, liquid amber, styraciflua. It's hated because it always drops these kind of things down, I think, and it's nice because it's grown quite willingly. And this has silver coming out of the cross section. Almost, It looks like silver. It's, of course, it's not silver, but it looks like silver. And if you see the inner bark, if you just scratch the bark a bit, you see it's glimmering. So it, it's, it has very cool roots. That's some of our roots. So that's new foundings. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, listening. Do you have any questions? Hello! Hi, Jo! <laughs> Brilliant! Well done, both of you. Absolutely fantastic, as always. Uh, as if by magic, I am now in my office. So we'll just edit that first bit out and it'll look like I was always here. Brilliant. Thank you. Lots of love in, in the chat there as well. And they love their little cartoon faces this lot. So you can <laughs> see them all doing whatever whatever they're doing there. Um, we, we, yes, yes, yes. Very, you're very clever, as always. Uh, very excited about the English translation of the book. I uh, I first encountered this uh, when I met Kristin, or met Kristin before, but saw her re most recently in Latvia, weren't we, in Riga. And I got very, very excited. <laughs> and um, we uh, agreed we would translate it into English. And then lots of people did lots of work in a very short space of time. Uh, and then we got T-shirts made up. Come on now. <laughs> Come on. And look... <laughs> posters <laughs> yes i got a bit carried away but i did find it all very very exciting okay we've got loads of questions we're not going to be able to get through oh. them all but we will have a little go and um a few people have been asking questions i've got paul's one here about have you had any have you seen anything about 
uh, different rooting habits with the same species, but in different soil types? No, uh, we have found that the, the different roots we have seen at, this is not a scientific project, so we haven't like had thousands and thousands of trees to look at. But the one we have seen, they may grow in different uh, soil, but the the morphology is more or less the same. When you have it in cross section and you have this, the the bark, they are more or less the same. And no matter if they grow in clay or in uh, what is sand. It, sand or loam, is more or less the same. Yeah. But but the, the the architect of the root or the structure of the root can differ quite a lot, mm -hmm. but not the morphology. What you see, the added identification sign. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I, we've got so many questions. I'm just kind of having to run through right. more rather than trying to pick them randomly. Um, Russell's asking if there's a notable noticeable difference in the root phenotype if they're cut in different seasons. So, for example, are there less exudations from the witch elm if the roots are cut in winter compared to in the summer? We have just seen that in the Salix caprea, which was not in this presentation, because in the Salix caprea, we, we, we uh, you know, uh, goat willow, I think. So, yeah, uh, that was very pink. In January and in May, it was not that pink. So that could be a change. So that could be something. But the, the um, we haven't it, cut enough roots to no. quite tell the difference between yeah. seasons. But the the ginkgo was similar. The the one we have was similar. Oh, and they're also pink. I mean, yeah. The ginkgo is brilliant, I, and I. I think a few people have said this in the chat, but it was incredible to me because I've sort of, you know, uh, had my arboricultural education at a time when we're told that the only way you could identify roots really was to send them off for lab testing and for DNA testing. Mm -hmm. And when I first saw the book, I just thought, why has nobody done this before? Like it just, it just seemed so mm -hmm. obvious that it was a great idea. And uh, so, yeah, you're now the root people. You know that, aren't you? You know, right? yeah. It's the root people. But I think the main goal is that, uh, or it, it, it would be surprisingly if the trees should have same looking roots when they look so different above ground. So the um, underground section of the tree is as different as the above ground compared to each the different species and it's quite it's quite clear it's yeah, yeah it should, it, that's the way it should be yeah amazing love it i'm still excited about it i'm such a child <laughs> um so mark has asked if you are thinking about setting up an app that could be used for tree root identification uh, we have been asked that several times and the answer is no, we haven't. We are not tech freaks. We are root freaks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so far, we haven't got so many roots that it's, um, it, I think a PDF would be as well as good as it. And I, uh, maybe I'm a bit traditional, but I think if you use too many apps, you may not use your brain so much. So I like to encourage to use the brain and your your visual sight and what you see mm -hmm. and just not take a photo and have a match. But of course, maybe if we get like thousands and thousands of trees, an app would be a good idea. Yeah. And we have as well talked, haven't we, about, I can say this, we're only, there's only there's only 500 odd people here. We've talked about a possible ebook as well, haven't we? So uh, we're mm -hmm. maybe looking at an ebook version. But there's something, I'm old fashioned as well. It's just a nice thing to have. It's a nice there thing. Is actually ebook in Norwegian? Well, I'm sure everyone out there reads Norwegian. I have a copy in the original Norwegian, of course, which I fully uh, understand, definitely. Um, one main thing about the book that was mentioned in the chat, sorry, this is more my comment than a question, but uh, someone was talking about uh, the fact that, uh, I don't know, there weren't books in stock or something. We've got loads of books in stock. Please buy books from us. But we're not like Amazon or something. When book orders are made, it goes downstairs and uh, my colleague Georgina then goes and picks it and gets it and packs it and sends it. So it's out, It's the team here 
uh, who are doing it. So there's not some magical Amazon thing going on. So be patient. You've not known anything about Roots for ages. Why do you need to rush all of a sudden? Um, OK, a couple of people have asked about root architecture. Um, so sort of uh, like uh, Francis Halle's tree architecture systems and those beautiful uh, drawings and diagrams that uh, Halle's done. Have you been looking at root architecture at all, as well as just the identification of the actual root, the sort of the patterns and the shapes of them? No, no, we haven't. Well, John says maybe a second book. What do you think? Maybe a second book. Yeah. And the, the, the Austrian book, the big book, Wurzel Atlas, they have done amazing work on that. They have actually um, excavated some of the trees and they have drawn all the roots there. And that's also available on the internet. So there are people who have done quite a lot of that, but I think we can go more into details and more see how, like, how the, the root grows. But here, I think the soil and the condition of the soil will matter quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Uh, and uh, something's disappeared from there, but, I had a, but um, Amelia mentioned that people should consider getting bonsai trees and getting into bonsai if they want to understand more about roots. And Amelia did a fantastic presentation for us a couple of years ago about bonsai, but a uh, really, really good way to get up close and personal and learn about roots and how they all sort of work. I don't know whether you've had any encounters with bonsai in your research for this. No, sorry. But I thought there was someone asking about which book I ref refer to, and it's the... Um... Wurzel Atlas. Do you know it? Which one? Wurzel Atlas. Wurzel Atlas. Is it Austrian book? Austrian book. My I my uh, yeah. Keep I only speak Norwegian and English, unfortunately. <laughs> my only two languages. I'm hoping she's gone to just get something. I've not she's been just gone off to, to get the book. She's not done the Harry stud home, and I've got to improvise yeah. for half an hour. Yeah. We call that doing a stud home now, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, okay. Oh, there's a few people typing in the chat what it is. Ha oh, there we are. Ah. You see it? I do see it. Yeah, cool. It's a nice. We used to have a, we used to have a band down this part of the world called the Wurzels. You see that? There's the architecture there. Oh, uh, yeah. Ooh, cool. Yeah, very cool. I like it. Not as good as the Wurzels, though, but yeah. <laughs> right, we're getting all the all the cultural uh, references in today. Um, brilliant. Okay, now, what was I looking at? Oh, I've lost that question as well. Ah, Peter's asked, do roots develop heartwood as they thicken? I don't think so, no. We haven't seen it in that way we see it in the stem so that's also something that had to be studied a bit more i think we haven't cut that many large roots because we don't want to cut large roots <laughs> they're making the ultimate sacrifice for mm -hmm. science yeah. so if you're going to fell a big tree you should cut them and it would be very interesting another question for all of you is if you cut a tree could you try to find a root that is as old as the stem you cut? I doubt you will find it. Can I say that again? If you cut a tree, yeah. you can count the earrings, yeah. and then you dig up the closest, the, the thickest root, and you, cut, and you cut the root, yeah. and you think... You, you count the earrings of the root and see if that matches the age of the tree stem. Because Gary Watson asked me about this as well. And also Ted Green. And they haven't found this, this correlation. So what happens to the roots as the tree grows? Why, why are the tree's roots younger than the stem? Can anyone, well, ask, anyone ask? I hope you're not asking me that question. I just... I'm just like a chat show host these days. I don't really do any, <laughs> any actual tree stuff. Uh, well, we have a very knowledgeable audience out there. Somebody might even say something. 
uh, in the chat, but we'll, we won't wait. We won't wait on you all, obviously. No, but, uh, they, they can have a presentation next time. Yeah, and we'll send the chat, of course, to our speakers, and then they can have a look at it and, and all that sort of thing. Right. Uh, what else have we got in here? There's loads. Uh, so, so Ben's commented on the fact that in a lot of the cross-section photos that you showed, the centre point, uh, so the pith, seems to be off-centre. It's mm -hmm. not in the middle, it's off-centre, particularly on the oaks. Um, any, any sort of thoughts on why that might be? Um, it, it's, it comes from different situation, I think. And, and, and this, I think this maybe has something to do with the soil condition, but also where in the soil that it grows and maybe it grows a bit more underneath where it's no, so, not, not so much pressure because the growth, as I mentioned for them, the horse chestnut, you see, it's very tight and it's, it's not so big as a branch. So, because it lives on very uh, compact conditions, and the roots tend to grow um, more widely, where it actually have the possibility to to grow. You see that if you have um, uh, roots growing in pebbles or, or stones, you call it pebbles, yeah. And then you see it grows like this, and you have like big lumps of roots and smaller roots, and it's quite like funny to look at. And I think actually the roots just grow where it can grow but i have that question before and i am um, uh, we haven't seen a particular pattern when we have dug up the root and see this but we see that the, um, the center is not always in the middle mm -hmm. mm. interesting stuff there's so much more isn't there to to uh, to explore and to research yeah. mm -hmm. uh fantastic so uh talking of having to do more david has said he bought a copy of the book. He thinks it's excellent and very interesting to read and look at. What well and David. But the first time David needed to use it, he wanted to ID a Leylandii. Dun, dun, dun. Uh -oh. Now, Leylandii isn't in the book, but it is a tree that uh, causes lots of problems, some may say. Is Leylandii going to be on your the, the next edition? What's the what's the Latin name of Lalandia? L oh, Leylandii uh, suppressociparis. Suppress? Leyland cypress. It's the mm -hmm. ones that yeah. neighbours plant between gardens when they don't like the person who lives next door to them. Then everyone ah, complains okay. about it forever. Yeah, definitely. We will have that in the next book, definitely. Mm. Yeah, good. Yeah. Marvellous. Yeah. So, David, don't worry, it'll be coming soon. And of course, you can go and do your own research. Don't get, I mean, I'm not saying you should dig up your neighbor's tree roots, obviously, but <laughs> you know, think about uh, Steve has asked if roots compartmentalize the same as wood tissues above the ground. What did you say? Do tree roots compartmentalize when damaged? Do they uh, sort of follow the kind of Shigo model? We don't know, but I hope. Um... Someone will find that out. Uh, and Andrew Benson is going to do some research on that and some trees, I think, from New Zealand. Maybe he can answer next year or in a couple of years. <clears throat> Give that over to him. Or um, <laughs> Andrew Kosher maybe can answer that one. Because we have seen some damaged roots that have some kind of, of uh, grow, overgrowth but we haven't seen the typical pattern. And we haven't studied that many damaged roots because unluckily we can say we have studied very much fresh roots that are going to be damaged. Yeah. Mm. Makes sense. Thank you. And thank you to all of our audience who are, are telling me the correct botanical name for Leylandii. <laughs> I don't, I don't read really do trees anymore. I'm more of a clipboard HR person, that, that kind of thing. Um, right. Nola's asked, how many roots per species of tree from different locations did you have to look at in order to establish that the attributes you're using for identification are consistent? Mm, we had the root, the trees. You know, I'm doing all the answering, are you? Mm. Okay. Um, we have the we have the roots from trees that we could access in the 
in Oslo center, most of all, there were actually real street trees and there were real trenches. So we got those trees. And then we had a landscape laboratorium in um, in the university, which is a big park with 100 different tree species. And we could have a look at those trees to compare them so we could be sure that this was the correct uh, uh, what we have seen out in the in the trench in the city was the same as in this um, landscape laboratorium which had different kind of soil of course because that's one area and we also had to compare some roots with um, the ones that I dug up in New Jersey or we dug up in New Jersey so we can also compare and the thing we found was that it were very similar, but it's not very many trees. No, it's not very many trees. We could we could have more, but I also have got quite a lot of pictures sent by lots of people from all around the world, and so the picture that people send in show tell me the same. They look the similar. You're getting a lot of root. Fan mail now. Yes. Unsolicited <laughs> root bitches. Yeah. I think there's I think there's laws against that. You want to but that's fine. <laughs> um okay. Mike has asked if you found any evidence of fungi or disease identifiable in the roots that you've dug up. No. no. There's root rot. There's root rot, root rot. We have seen different kinds of root rot, white rot brown rot, if you can call it that, but we haven't seen, we haven't tested or sent into the laboratorium what kind of root it is. And we haven't seen a correlation if there were uh, fungus on the tree that we could identify and the roots. We haven't seen that, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's so many questions and I know a lot of the answers to a lot of the questions are going to be, we don't know. And I know that just because there's so much work to be done, but it's still interesting to do the discussion. And uh, yeah. and one I suspect you're you're going to say we don't know uh, from Andrea. Have you noticed any difference in root architecture between regularly pollarded trees and untouched trees? Nope, we haven't. We haven't had any roots from pollards at all. I think. Um, but that, that's interesting because you would guess there was a difference. But do you think it would be a difference in the root? Uh, no, not the, the morphology, no. Not the morphology, that would be the same, but probably the root, root uh, ar ar architectural will be different, I think. Or I have learned it will be. So we're, we gonna start, we're all going to start digging up a lot more roots now, I think. Yeah. In a sustainable in a sustainable, yeah, sustainable way. way. That's important. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. yeah. And we're hoping, aren't we? I think I feel like I can say this. We're hoping we're gonna do some workshops with you over here in the UK uh, this year, I think. Are we gonna try and do them this year? I think we said. We did, yeah. Yeah. So uh get out there and uh, and and actually get some little microscopes and stuff out, which would be quite cool. So look out for that, everybody. Uh, a couple of people. Uh, who said, uh, Rachel said, Rowen said, would you, do you actively want people to send you photos about Root in the Encounter? <laughs> I really want to call on everybody to send yes. you all of their Root photos, but you yeah. might not want that. I actually do, yes, because then we can have a source we can see. It doesn't matter if the picture is not so good, but it will tell if you see some difference in the oaks and if you see some difference, and then we will have more, since we are not scientists, we just do this for fun, actually, in our spare time. So we don't have time to dig up all roots unless we come across them. So um, if people can send them in, it would be great. So we can have a, like a big pool of uh, of mm. different roots. You not agree? Yeah, we could. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we should set up an own email server for that. <laughs> so we don't get... Yeah. Shall I, <laughs> shall I give them your like your numbers? Would that help? They can just, they can just send them to you. Um, where should they send them? Were they wanting to help? It could send them. Uh, we'll send you something. 
I think. Well, that just means I'll send it to me. No. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, but we can, we can, uh, we will have an email address. You can send it to. Okay, cool. So we we'll sort it out. That. Yeah, we have this field guide email address. Can you use that one? I think. Yeah. Okay, so hmm. uh, we can we can put as and when we've got an email that people can use, we can put it on the website and put it out to everyone yeah. and tell them. Uh, but do not send me your unsolicited root picks. I don't want to see them. Thanks. No, no. But we want to have the name of the of the tree species. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. We, we we won't identify anyone's roots. No, we won't identify them. No, no, no. We just that won't. is definitely coming. I don't know if he's watching, but that's what I do to David Humphreys, obviously, with Chris Wright wrote the fungi identification book. I find I don't need the book anymore because I just take pictures and send it to him and pester him. And that's what I'm going to be doing with roots with you two. We will not answer any questions for that. We'll just collect. <laughs> yeah. It will be a no reply or maybe thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Neville's asked if your studies have had an impact on arboriculture in Norway. Yes, it has. Yes, definitely. Um, it has uh, have the impact that people are more aware of roots and talk about a bit more about them. And I also think it's a bit uh, for the bestiller, um, the, the people there. The commune, the mm. commune, or, or people that order work also know that. Oh, have you? Do you know that this tree has to have roots? Yeah, yes, we know. But so I think I think it has helped in a bit to get the um, the recommendation for roots a bit higher up, or uh, like people aware of more roots. And also, it has been used. I know several people have used it when they actually have been digging quite close to trees and say, "Oh, oh, here is the oak tree. Do, this is the oak root." Please, mm-hmm. we have to change the the trench for this in this situation, and then that they change the trench. That's also because we have this very strict law um, yeah. regarding oak trees. Mm. Yeah, and is it just oak? Could you actually? Because you mentioned that, could you explain that law and how it works? Because you you referred to it right at the beginning, but what is exactly mm-hmm. that protection around? It's a Norwegian Nature Act, uh, and it protects all oak trees that are over 200 in circum- circumference, circumference 1.3 meters above ground in park and not in not in forestry or at least if they are like 25 meters inside the forestry they are still protected by this law and it's a law made up because we know that there are lots of lots of lots of lots of lots of lots of lots of, of organisms living in oak trees like 1,500 or something in the whole uh, lifespan for an oak. And they are species specific. For oak. For oak. And in Norway, we lack old old trees because we did have a massive exportation of oak trees to Europe and other places. And we built all these ships and stuff like that. So we actually lack home for these insects. So that's why we have this law. But the bi- biologists, maybe they want to have like not law for just oak trees, but a law uh, or an act for uh, all old trees. But mm. so far, it's just the oak trees that are protected. Right. Okay. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, just answering one of those. Yes. It, it. What I. It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Sorry. What's that? No, we just on someone asked about the 200, but it's 200 centimeters in circumference in yeah. breast height, which is the normal breast height is 1.3 above ground. Mm. I think Peter's asking what the DBH is of a 200 centimeter circumference tree, and someone out there will be able to do the maths. Oh, 63. <laughs> 60. Now, hang on. Did You didn't do that. You've just read it off there. I read you? it, yeah. Right, yeah. I thought okay, it was 64. Fine, fine. DBA to 63. Okay. Well done, John, possibly. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I'm going to go with it. <laughs> you can use it, fine, yeah. Um, 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 Valentin's asked a question. That, again, I think I know the answer to, but interested on your take on it. Valentin's saying, why is it so important to identify roots in the field instead of just protecting all the roots you encounter? Um, 
Yeah, you can see why it's important to know what tree species you are dealing with, because we need to know this when you are having a trench close to a tree and you're going to protect the tree and you can't protect the whole root, so, root zone for some reason that are out of our hands. And if you then know this is the, for instance, this is the oak root that are going to be, be protected, you can then just save it, you don't have to cut it, and you can uh, put the lines or cabling underneath it, for instance, or you can say to them, the digger, stop, you cannot hurt this, you cannot cut this root anymore, because then the tree might die. And you will also know how many roots that are exposed that belong to this tree. So you can say, say something about how many percentage of, or maybe you can say something about how many percentage of the root zone actually are going to be cut away. And may that will lead to lack of vitality of the tree. And if you're going to fell a lot of other trees, then you can save money by knowing that, okay, but this, this root here, this is from the lilac, this root here is from the poplar. We can just cut them away. We don't need them anymore. Then we can just dig there instead. Yeah, that's. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Where are we? We've probably got time for a couple more <laughs> questions. Some of them are kind of not, not repeat questions, but lots of people have asked similar things. Um, you, if you wanted to, can you see the questions on there? Have you got we them see, open? We see some of them. Because if you if you see anything in there that you think is particularly exciting you'd like to address, then please, uh, please do. Um, uh, Magdalena's asked a question about translations. I know there's been a couple of people interested in translating the book into other languages, uh, as obviously we did. I are you sort of in the market for be to for talking to people about translated versions? Yeah, we are doing a, a German translation now, and it's quite a lot of, of. We don't do so much work on that when they do it almost all itself, but there are, there is quite a lot of work to like. You know, to make the deals and um, have the contract stuff and yeah, the contract and stuff like that. Okay, we haven't done a contract yet. Have we? we haven't got a contract yet. Ah, so done on uh, trust right now. Yeah, so so we 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 do not have the capacity to do translation all over. We have to do one at the time. So if we can hire someone to do it for us, that would be great. But yeah. So. Yes, it yeah. would be nice if this book could be in every language in the world. But then again, people usually tend to read English. So maybe that's good enough. And now it will be in German as well. And of course, in Norwegian, which, which like 4 million people speaks. <clears throat> so it's good. <laughs> but we have a, we have a questions from quite a lot of places that want to be want it translated and want a book for their tree selections. So maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe. But we do all this work on our spare time and we do have limited spare time. Mm -hmm. But you're we just, are. You're just are. amateur root botherers, aren't you? Yeah, but, but we are actually applying for um, making a new edition, looking a bit more into finer roots as well and American species. So maybe yeah. we, if we get that sorted... That would be a, a good um, add to this uh, collection of root samples. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Have you seen any questions that you'd like to look up, by the way? Because I'm mm -hmm. looking through a few now and I'm just, mm -hmm. um, we've, we've got till I've like two more. And then I've got my last question, of course. <laughs> um, Paul's asked whether or not you notice a significant depth difference of depth difference of roots between species so did you find that for some particular species of tree you were having to dig much deeper to find the same material as in other trees no it more depends on the soil condition and the water level and yeah if there's a road nearby or yeah mm. Mm -hmm. there's many different factors that play in on the depth of roots but, but there are so, sometimes the roots are surprisingly uh, uh, shallow. shallow and surprisingly down in the earth as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it, um, it, more it more depends on the, the condition of the, the soil and how much air it is in the soil because the root doesn't tend to, to grow where it's very, very little air yeah. or much, too much water. 
Thank you. And then a question from Chris asking, can your work, do you think, be used as the basis for new guidance about pruning roots? So there's various rules of, well, literally rules of thumb, you know, don't cut roots bigger than your thumb sort of thing. It's all quite mm -hmm. generic and there's lots of scope for misunderstanding and problems. Is the work you've done, can that be applied, do you think, to a practical root pruning guide? No, I think this book is more like um, like, a, like a flora. It's more like telling you what you see. And it can be used as a complementary thing to some other books that can describe that more more better. Because we have not gone into that road. We're just trying to see the morphology of the root. And I think that's what it is. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, Naomi's asked whether or not planners and the people responsible for designing construction projects have sought your assistance. Since you've started getting in more and more involved in this, have you had more construction companies, designers coming to you saying we need this kind of identification? Um, yeah, I can just speak for myself here, but I think it's not maybe not just because of the book, but because of stricter regulation where I live and or where we live in Oslo that the communa ask for more. You have to have an arborist in your project that can help you out with this planning. Or also an early stage. So it's not, it's more like the, the communa that gives the regulations for us. And of course, also the state and, and this, um, this uh, act of nature that provide, um, protect these oak trees. They don't come to us specifically because we wrote this book. They, they seek out arborists in general. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's good. Okay, mm. good stuff. Thank you. Right, there's one more question I'll ask, and then I'll do one more question. And one and one makes two questions, of course, as we all very familiar <laughs> with. Uh, Anthony says, how much evidence did you see of cross-species root grafting or even mycorrhizal connections? Very little, very little. We saw very little cross section to grow together. So I thought we would find much more of that. But maybe some of the roots were growing like on top of each other, but they were not connected. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why, but we didn't see so much of that. And we did not see so much mycorrhiza either. Uh, but we didn't study the final roots so much. And that we may will do later on to study more of the final roots. And then I, I I hope or I think we will see more mycorrhiza then. Mm -hmm. Because the mycorrhiza do not grow in the finger thick uh, roots. They grow more in them in the final roots. Yeah. Interesting. So much still to mm -hmm. learn. Okay. Well, we have got one final question, of course. Oh, and of that course. question is: what is your favorite tree-related? book <laughs> oh come on now no, it's not, okay it's not. <laughs> we have one yeah. we have one we, we will take your first you can okay. take um, this is a book specifically for norwegians um it's a norwegian book that describes 33 ancient trees in norway and the history behind them uh historical things around those trees, uh, sp uh, species, uh, descriptions, uh, um, people around those trees, where they live the, around those trees. And uh, yeah, and I, I've climbed a few of these trees, so it's quite fun to read, yeah. Fantastic. Is that only available in Norwegian, that one? Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, it's worth learning Norwegian for then. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That's another new choice. We've not had that before. And as is this. What's this? We have one more book. Of course, we, <laughs> we have allowed one each. We were allowed one each. Okay. Yes, that's fine. yes, this is also in Norwegian. And it is of the giants. Um, pine trees. Pine trees in Norway. And it's from a place called Troll Home, the home of the trolls. And there is actually a guy that have been searching for the biggest and widest and uh, biggest pine trees in Norway. In volume. In volume. So they have 
uh, I'll show you. They have actually, they have uh, climbed these trees and measure them around the, um, the branches. Every 10 centimeters or so Every circumference yeah. around the whole right. tree to measure the volume of. And I really like this because they have not used a drone or a LIDAR or anything. They actually use measurement to measure the whole tree. Yeah. So you can have them, the volume of every tree. It's a nice book and it's also full of uh, poetry and stuff like that. And it's so it's like this to go out hiking here. <laughs> Oh, that looks nice. Well, some a couple of people asked, uh, are there lots of lovely pictures for those who don't, for those idiots oh, yeah, who don't speak is. Norwegian? Yes, it's just lovely picture there. Just lovely picture. Wow, look at this. Ah, uh, packed with great photos. <laughs> okay, I'm just, there's various things coming. I'll have a look at your message later on, Max, properly. It's quite a long one there. Okay, well, look, two brilliant choices of books, two fantastic speakers and wonderful, lovely people. Thank you so much for joining us. That was absolutely brilliant. We had people always ask a question. We had probably about 600, I would say. about I, We probably just went over 600 at some point there. So, uh, hurrah! Thank hurrah. you all for coming. <laughs> Uh, merchandise, books, all those kind of things available on the website, of course. You won't necessarily look as good in your Rutter t-shirt as I will, but hey, we can't <laughs> all be me. So thank you so much to both of you. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you to still our sponsors, of course, and to all of you watching. Please do join us next week. Why do we lose so many trees with Russell Miller and James Chambers? Six o'clock next Wednesday. You can register now. And I hope to see you all then. So take care, stay safe, and thank you all once again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.